this transient conduction problem is actually going to be six problems in one. So we've got a stake that we're going to model as a wall, an orange that's being modeled as a sphere, and a hot dog that's going to represent a beef carcass as a cylinder. And we're going to solve them all the way through to surface temperature, which is going to be the hardest, longest transient conduction problems you're going to have in your heat transfer course. And in the end, for the last step, I'm going to solve for surface temperature two different methods, once using tables and once using equations so that you can evaluate both of your options. So this steak problem, we've got a steak that starts at negative eight degrees Celsius and we're removing it from the freezer and we're figuring out how long will it take to thaw and what will the surface temperature be when it is thawed? The orange is gonna start at 15 degrees Celsius, but we're saying freezing weather is coming in at negative four degrees. And we're gonna figure out in four hours, will any part of this orange freeze, which is gonna ruin the crop. And then the beef carcass cylinder, we're gonna say it starts off at 37 degrees Celsius and we throw it in the freezer. We're gonna figure out how long will it take for the center to cool to four degrees. And in doing so, will the surface temperature freeze during that time? So I start off by writing down my temperatures for all three of these problems, my conduction and convection coefficients, K and H, and then also the characteristic length for each of these. For a plain wall, characteristic length is actually gonna be half of the thickness, not the full thickness. So we're only using 0 0.025 for the stake. And then characteristic length for the sphere and the cylinder is just gonna be the radius. So what we're trying to find for each of these problems is gonna be the surface temperature and time. So the concept is transient conduction. That means conduction where we're not in steady state. Temperature is changing. This is unsteady state conduction. And that's gonna leave an open question, lumped capacitance or sudden convection. Lumped capacitance is preferable. This is the easy version. This means that the center and the surface temperatures are gonna be the same. Well, you can probably already guess these problems are not gonna be able to use that method. But for every transient conduction problem, you should always check the biot number first to see if you can use lumped capacitance because that'll make the problem way easier. So in checking for lumped capacitance, you have to find the biot number. That's H over K times volume divided by surface area. So for our stake, we've got the volume of the stake will be the surface area of the top times the thickness of the stake, which is 2L. And our total surface area is gonna be 2A because we have both sides of the stake. For a sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed divided by four pi r squared, which is surface area of a sphere. And then for the cylinder, volume is pi r squared L. That's the area of a circle times a length. And the surface area, two pi r times L, just the perimeter of the circle times the length. Since we're gonna be ignoring heat transfer through the ends of the cylinder, only looking at what's radiating out from the sides. So some calculator work, I get biot numbers of 0.4 for my stake, 0.35 for the sphere, and 2.8 for the cylinder. All three of these are greater than 0.1. 0 0.1 is the cutoff threshold for biot number. Small biot numbers, you can assume lumped capacitance, lumped heat capacity. Small biot numbers mean that the center temperature and the surface temperature can be assumed to be the same. And that happens when you have a really large value for K or a really small value for H. And unfortunately for this case, we have a large biot number, which means that our surface and center line temperatures are not going to be the same. So we are not able to use the lumped heat capacity method. So backup plan, if we can't use lumped heat capacity, then we want to use the sudden convection method, the one term approximation. In order to use this term, we have to check the Fourier number. We need to verify that the Fourier number is greater than 0.2 in order to justify the one term approximation method. Now probably all of your heat transfer problems will satisfy this criteria. So if you don't satisfy this, you may wanna double check your numbers. So I can pull up the FE reference manual and see that the Fourier number is gonna be alpha T divided by the characteristic length squared, either L squared for a wall or the radius squared for a sphere or a cylinder. And so you can see here that this is time dependent. A larger amount of time will lead to a larger Fourier number. And that gives us some insight as to what this one term approximation means. If we need the Fourier number to be greater than 0 0.2, 
we're essentially saying that this one term approximation can be used once we have a sufficient amount of time has taken place. So the one term approximation method does not account for the sudden shock at the very instant that temperature changes. It does not give you the first reaction. So as time passes and you get closer and closer to steady state, that's when the one term approximation method is going to be valid. And so it seems like in this problem, when we have things freezing or thawing, that this one term approximation probably should be able to be used because we're not interested in what happens immediately upon a change in temperature. We're more interested in what happens over a period of time. So we do expect that this method probably can be used, but we still need to verify. Now we don't actually have time for our plane wall and our cylinder problem, so we can't calculate the Fourier number yet for those, but we can calculate it for the sphere. So I'm gonna have to look up my value of alpha for water, and I'll write that down as an assumption, 1.36 times 10 to the minus seven. And I can plug in my four hours for time, which I'm gonna have to convert to seconds, and divide by the radius squared. And that gives me a Fourier number of 1.22, which check mark that is greater than 0.2, that verifies that I will be able to use the one term approximation methods for this spherical orange problem. So what do you do then if you don't know time, like in our wall and cylinder problem? So in that case, you're just gonna assume that you can use the one term approximation method and actually use the method to solve for the Fourier number and then verify that it is greater than 0.2 to actually justify your choice. So I'm gonna grab the one term approximation equation from the FE reference manual. You've probably also got it written in your textbook and you've got the ratio of temperatures on one side and then you've got this exponential function with some coefficients on the right hand side and these coefficients C and a lowercase Greek zeta, these are gonna be looked up in a table. Now when we pull up this one term approximation coefficients table, you're gonna see the left hand column is the Biot number. But take careful note of the footnote down at the bottom. This Biot number is not necessarily the same as the Biot number that we already calculated. The characteristic length used in the Biot number in this table is gonna be the radius for a cylinder, not volume divided by surface area. Now, fortunately for a plain wall, it's gonna end up being exactly the same. So we can use the same 0.4 biot number that we already found for the plane wall. And at 0.4 biot number for a plane wall, I see 0.5932 is my value for zeta that's gonna go up in this exponent. And 1.058 for my value for C that's gonna go in front as my coefficient multiplied in front. But for the cylinder, I need to calculate a new biot number using radius instead of volume over area. This new biot number is gonna be twice as big as the old one, 5.6. If you really wanna be extra, you can interpolate between the five and six rows and get a really good number here. But I'm gonna be mid and just kinda of eyeball it and choose 2.02 .02 for my zeta value and 1.52 for my C value, which looks close enough. It's a little bit past halfway. All right, some calculator work and we gotta do some natural log to get rid of the exponential terms. We get 1.6 as the Fourier number for the steak and 0.4 as the Fourier number for the hot dog beef carcass cylinder over there. Both of these are greater than 0.2, which does justify the use of the one term approximation method, which is what we expected, so good sign. So in order to find surface temperatures, you've got two different methods. One is gonna use equations and then one is gonna use figures. The equations is gonna be more accurate, but the figures is gonna be probably a little bit faster. So if you don't already have a heat transfer textbook by Leinhard, I do strongly recommend it. It's a free textbook, so you can download it yourself online. I'll put the link down in the description. And within this textbook, the author created figures for sudden convection problems to help you find surface temperatures for walls, cylinders, and spheres in order to avoid having to use the surface temperature equations. You can just kind of get a quick little eyeball reference on the figures themselves. So to use these figures, you're gonna need the Biot number, which is the horizontal axis, and the Fourier number, which is gonna show you which of these curved lines you're gonna be following. So as an example, for my stake, right, my plane wall, so if I go my horizontal axis to 0 
a Fourier number of 1.6 is gonna be in between the yellow and the green line, slightly closer to the green line, which is Fourier number of two. That look, and I trace that over to the left. It looks like I'm basically right on this line, which is at a theta of 0 0.5. And that theta value is a ratio of temperatures, T minus T infinity over T initial minus T infinity. So if we're saying the ambient temperature for this slab for the steak is 22 degrees Celsius, and the initial temperature when we pulled it out of the freezer was negative eight, we can solve and get a surface temperature of seven degrees Celsius. And so this value theta is sort of like a reverse percentage as to how far you are, how, how close you are to the final temperature, which is the ambient temperature. So rephrased, a very small value of theta will get you to a value of surface temperature very close to ambient temperature. A high value of theta is like your initial, right when temperature has started to change, you might still be kind of close to your initial temperature with a high value of theta. All right, so looking again for the sphere, this value of 1.05 on the horizontal axis, a value of 1.22 for the Fourier numbers. This is between the yellow and the green line, a little bit closer to the yellow, which is a Fourier value of one. And again, my R over R naught is equal to one because I'm my actual radius I'm interested in is the actual radius. I want the surface temperature. So I'm using the bottom figure on this page of four figures. Now Fourier number of two would be all the way at zero. My Fourier number of one is a little above. So I'm kind of interpolating here. It looks like a, a value of about 0 0.05 for theta. And this is suggesting that I'm getting very close to the ambient air temperature. And in fact, when I plug in and solve for surface temperature, I get negative 4.95 degrees, which is pretty close to the air temperature of negative six. So go to the third page, and now I've got, again, four very similar looking figures for the cylinder problem. I go to the horizontal axis, a biot number of 5.6, which would be kind of in between five and six, a Fourier number of 0 0.4, which is in between the red and orange lines, a little bit closer to the orange 0.5 line. And if I zoom all the way in here, again, it's kind of hard to read exactly. That's sort of the downside of looking at figures. I'll call this 0 0.07 for theta, which again is gonna lead me to a surface temperature that's pretty close to the air temperature. And as a little bit of calculator work, I get a surface temperature of negative 6.7 degrees Celsius, which again is pretty close to the air of negative 10. And that's what you expect with a, a theta value on these figures close to zero. You expect to be not close to your initial temperature. You expect to be closer to your air temperature. But now let's double check these figures with some equations. So rather than just trusting some random figures you've downloaded from a textbook that a YouTuber led you to, Let's actually trust the equations that are found in your textbook and calculate surface temperatures that way as a way to confirm that these figures actually do make sense. So here's three different equations I pulled from a textbook that will let you find the surface temperature for a slab, a sphere, and a cylinder. In fact, all of these have a ratio, X over L or R over R naught, so it doesn't only work at the surface. You could also find it at any point in between the center and the surface. But for this problem, we'll be using X over L and R over R equal to one to just find the surface temperature. So for a slab, we've got a cosine zeta term. So for a sphere, a sine zeta over zeta term. And for a cylinder, we've got this J term, which is a Bessel function. And now you know why I like those figures that are published in the Leinhardt book, because who the heck even knows what a Bessel function is? You've probably never seen this before, but it's definitely something to, to be avoided if you can. And so starting with our, our slab, our steak equation, we essentially have a ratio of temperatures involving the surface as compared to a ratio of temperatures involving the center. So the denominators are the same starting temperature to air temperature, the negative eight and the 22. And the numerator for the surface temperature, we've got that final temperature of four degrees and we're solving for the surface temperature of the wall. Now this value zeta is just something you'll look up in a table, not something you'll memorize or calculate it. You just look it up in a table, 0.5932. And so this value 0.6 essentially represents that the center has gone 40% of the way towards the ambient air temperature from where it started. Because again, remember these are kind of going, starting from one and going down to zero. And now this cosine term is essentially a, a lag component. It's saying how much is the center line temperature lagging behind the surface temperature? Because the surface temperature is what's gonna be changing first and the center line temperature is gonna lag behind as the heat propagates inside the part itself. 
And so a really large cosine value, cosine value of one, would show that they're actually the same, that there is no lag at all, and a really small cosine value would be a lot more lag. So with this cosine of 0.59 gives us a value of 0.82 inside this cosine, which shows that it's mostly keeping up with the outside, right? That's a pretty high. And we can plug and chug and get to a surface temperature of 7.07 .07 degrees. And so that shows that the four degrees in the center of the stake and seven degrees on the outside, that those are pretty close. And what this also shows is that I was able to read that figure pretty good, getting to seven degrees versus 7.07, .07, those are basically the same answer. Now to solve for the surface temperature of the sphere, I'm actually gonna need the centerline temperature of the sphere, which I didn't actually solve for yet. I had time, but I never actually solved for the actual center temperature. So we've got to go back to the one term approximation function with, with that C and zeta values. So I calculate a new biot number for the sphere using the characteristic length of the radius. I get 1.05 and I take that 1.05 over to my one term approximation table where I can look up my coefficients. And again, if you want to be extra, you can interpolate between one and two, but I'm just gonna eyeball it here and just be kind of mid. So I'm gonna grab 1.58 for my zeta, which is pretty close to the value for one. And I'm gonna grab 1.28 for my coefficient, for my C value. So my Fourier term was 1.22 and plug in all my temperatures. And I finally calculate that the center temperature for the orange was negative 4.7 degrees. So now I'm writing out my surface temperature equation where I've got a fraction on the left, including my surface temperature a fraction on the right that includes the center line temperature, and then this sine zeta over zeta, and that's that same 1.58 that I looked up just a minute ago. So this gives us to a surface temperature, once we plug everything in, of negative 5.2 degrees Celsius. Now it seems like the center and the surface temperature are actually pretty close. They're only about a half a degree apart. But when you compare that to how close the surface temperature is to the air, is only an, a 0.8 degree difference. The center of the orange is actually almost double the difference away. So it, it, even though the absolute value is pretty close together, relatively speaking, there is actually kind of a big gap in between the two temperatures. So for this cylinder now, this is the value J, which is a Bessel function. I think the best way that I can explain the Bessel function for right now is just type it in a MATLAB or just look it up in a table, just Google it. So if we want a, the Bessel function of zeroth order, just type in Bessel function of 2.02. .02, and here in MATLAB, that gives me a value of 0.2124. So I've got my ratio of surface temperatures, my ratio of centerline temperatures, and then this Bessel function. Plug that all in, I get a surface temperature of negative 7.03 degrees. For my sphere, I had negative 4.95, and I got negative 5.2 using the equation. For the cylinder, I was negative 6.7 and then negative 7.0 for using an equation. So for all three of these problems, the figures and the equations gave pretty close answers to each other. So if you have access to these figures in the free Lionheart textbook, that's pretty good confirmation. Go ahead and use them. It's not going to be perfectly accurate because reading in, you know, in between lines on a plot is always going to be, there's, there's going to be a little bit of error there. But as compared to using a Bessel function, that might be a good choice. So if this one dimensional transient conduction problem with sudden convection has been a little bit overwhelming, just too many shapes, all these extra steps to try to find surface temperature, and you want a simpler problem where you're just kind of plug and chug just to, to build up some muscle memory for it, go ahead and click the video on the screen now. It's gonna be a much simpler, shorter, more straightforward problem.